for tonight. We are exploring the exhibition Simple Pleasures, The Art of George Lee, which is on view at the Figgy through May 8th, 2022. Simple Pleasures presents the first major critical assessment of Doris Lee's work and includes over 70 pieces by the artist spanning the 1930s through the 1960s. Both public and um, private collections are included in this and we're very grateful to have it on display. The exhibition was organized by the Westmoreland Museum of American Art and co-curated by Barbara L. Jones, Chief Curator of the Westmoreland and Melissa Wolf, Curator of American Art at the St. Louis Art Museum. Like I said, we're grateful for the opportunity to share the exhibition with our community, just as we're grateful to be sharing this program with you tonight as we explore the Doris Lee Archive, which is housed in the National Museum of Women in the Arts Library and Research Center. Here to take us on this exploration is Emily Moore, former archival assistant at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. So Emily is the librarian in residence in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division at the Library of Congress. She holds a bachelor degree in art history and cinema from the University of Toronto and a master of library and information science degree from the University of Maryland. Her current work focuses, focuses on the intersection of archiving and the creative process, and she is slowly but steadily learning the ropes of the rare book world. It is my great pleasure to welcome Emily to Figgy programming this evening. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so yes, my name is Emily Moore, and I am the formal archival assistant at NIMWA. And while I'm no longer with the museum, I'm still just a huge supporter of their mission and of what they do. And I really love the library and this collection. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, so I first encountered the Doris Lee Archive when I started as an intern at the National Museum of Women in the Arts uh, in the summer of uh, 2019. And that's the building that you see here in this picture in downtown DC. So in addition to being the world's largest museum dedicated to showing the creative work of women, NIMWA is also home to the Betty Boyd Dietrich Library and Research Center, or the LRC. It's DC, we have lots of acronyms. Um, and the LRC is just this incredible resource for researchers and for scholars, and then also for the general public. So at the moment, the museum and the library are undergoing a really massive renovation, but there are still um, people there who are able to answer your research questions and they provide access to our virtual resources. So we have online exhibitions, there's access to the catalog, and there are research guides. So I've just provided here a little screenshot of the LRC's website just to give you guys a sense of what you can access on that website. Um, the library also has amazing artist profiles, which are a great point of entry for exploration of women artists beyond the museum's collection, including a profile on Doris Lee. So I would encourage you guys to check that out. Uh, just a little bit of a background on the history of the Doris Lee collection. It was accessioned in the 1990s under the guidance of Christina Wasserman, who is the original founding librarian of the LRC. And for any archivists in the room, I've got a couple of specs for you. Uh, the collection is about 13.5 linear feet or about 29 boxes. And it's this really wonderful mix of primary and secondary source materials from Doris Lee. So we have things that she produced, items that she referred to in her work, and then also materials from her life. So there are photographs, there's correspondence, there's clippings, uh, printed ephemera, sketches by Lee, source materials, and then even things like textiles. And I think that this mix really reflects the scope and breadth of Lee's uh, practice and her output. She was an artist who did not discriminate between the realms of fine art, craft, and then commercial products. And she always brought her very specific vision to all of the myriad things that she worked on. Uh, and I will later drop the link in for the finding aid or the index for the collection in case anybody wants to take a look at that. So tonight we're gonna dive into the archive to explore two things. Uh, one, we're gonna get to know Doris through her photographs. The collection is home to lots and lots of photographs and slides. Uh, so tonight what I'm gonna be showing you is just the tip of the iceberg. And then after that, we're gonna take a look at how the archive uh, documents her artistic output how the materials of her life were really deeply ingrained into her creative practice and how her environment really set up the work that she made. So again, I'm just so thrilled to be here to do this. I'm such a big fan of Doris Lee and I'm so excited to see her being celebrated and discussed. 
So big thank you to Melissa and the Figgy for the invitation and for also giving me a virtual tour of the exhibition. I'm based in DC, so it was my first time getting to see uh, an exhibition with a robot. And it was amazing. I really got a feel for the space and the show, and I'm just really grateful to have that opportunity. Uh, lastly, I would also like to note how great the catalog for this show is. Uh, it's robust and it's thoughtful, and I learned a lot from the essays, so I would encourage all of you to get your hands on it if you can. So with that, let's dive in. So Doris Lee was born Doris Elizabeth Emmerich just about 115 years ago on February 1st, 1905. Uh, she was the fourth of six daughters, and she grew up surrounded by a large extended family that included two great-grandmothers, grandmothers, aunts, uncles and cousins. And here we have a photograph of Lee at about age 15 months. In 1920, she was sent to boarding school, a move that prompted her to chop off her hair, an act that resulted in her temporary suspension, as she later noted, nice girls have long hair. Uh, after graduating from college in 1927, Doris really began to pursue art. And in 1935, her painting Thanksgiving won the Logan Prize from the Chicago Art Institute. And this was a rather controversial win. It drew the ire of the prize's namesake, a Miss Josephine Hancock Logan, who Doris referred to as Huffy. And Miss Logan felt that the painting was in her uh, description, quote, awful, atrocious, and unspeakable. But for her part, Lee defended the painting, noting that, quote, if some of the faces look like cartoons, so do some people. And for those of you who do get to see the show, you'll obviously get to see this painting, uh, but also do keep your eyes peeled for a homemade award made by one of Lee's friends, uh, Waldo Pierce, who some refer to as the American Renoir. He made Lee this wonderful alternative prize certificate titled, How Little Doris Bought the Thanksgiving Bacon Home from Chicago. And it's one of my favorite things in the show. In the years following Thanksgiving's win, Lee worked for the Works Progress Administration, uh, painting murals in the General Post Office here in DC, which is now home to the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and she also completed commissions for Life Magazine, painting and writing articles on faraway locales, including North Africa and Central America. And the archive is home to two of her passports, one of which you see here. And over the course of her career, uh, Doris would work in Hollywood, she would travel the globe and she would also build a lifelong community in Woodstock, New York. In 1983, Lee passed away after a 15 year battle with Alzheimer's. Uh, this photo is not from the 1980s, but I picked it because I think it gives us a sense of Doris and repose. Uh, as you'll see, Lee was really somebody who was bursting with life. And I like that this picture shows her quieter, sort of more thoughtful side. So now we're gonna return to the beginning. Uh, this is a birthday postcard that Lee sent to her grandmother around age four or five. So as I mentioned, Lee grew up surrounded by a large extended family. Um, in a note from 1945, she recalled the crafty environment of her youth, remembering that, quote, they were always making things, painting pictures, carving frames, quilting, building furniture, and nursing a great variety of plants and flowers. And this early exposure to art and craft is really visible in her later work, uh, from her vibrant use of color to her visual, visual meditations on quotidian moments. And we get to enjoy that vision in almost every type of artistic product. You know, over the course of her career, she would design greeting cards, calendars, menus, and even things like pottery and textiles. Lee's mother was a school teacher, and her father was a merchant and banker who, in Lee's remembering, had a great flair for travel, which is something that she would later share. Uh, she took piano and painting lessons, and she described herself as a tomboy who liked to ride horses bareback. In her adolescence, Doris was vibrant and social. The archive has wonderful images of her with her girlfriends, whether they're at school, they're goofing around, they're swimming, and just sort of generally growing up. Uh, and this picture with her, with her visible curls, she's on the right. Uh, this was clearly taken before he she chopped her hair off into the bob while at her boarding school, Fairy Hall. In addition to her week-long suspension after cutting her hair, Lee was required to memorize poetry as part of her punishment, uh, something that she actually later described as being a very rewarding and pleasurable habit. And here again, we have Lee, she is on the right. She's post hair chop and she's cuddled up with a girlfriend. 
I feel like her manner is really inviting in this photograph. She's very calm. She has these wonderful long sleeves and these big cuffs. So Ferry Hall, her boarding school, was founded in 1869 in Lake Forest, Illinois, and it taught subjects beyond those that were typically taught at a finishing school, uh, including things like science and mathematics. It was very important to Lee's parents that she be well-rounded and be educated, and that's something that would impact her studies later in college. Uh, Ferry Hall had a strict culture. They required daily attendance at chapel and offered little opportunity for visitors. But the girls at Ferry Hall seem to do just fine. So here is Doris in a big crowd. She's right in the center with muddy shins and a big grin. Uh, there are a number of photos of her with her and the young woman on her left who she has her arm thrown around. Uh, these two very clearly had a nice close relationship. <clears throat> so Lee had a really fun and adventurous style. This photograph is one of a series that was uh, taken during a single session. They're all against the same brick wall with the same light time of day, but in each one she appears in a different ensemble and the drop waist and geometric designs of the 1920s abound. After leaving Ferry Hall, Doris went to Rockford College, another all girls school. And she graduated from Rockford in 1927, as I mentioned. She majored in philosophy, but she also took courses in mathematics and art. So her parents sound like they were really interesting, complex people. It sounds like they were dynamic and funny. But despite their own creative natures and the creative culture of their family, Lee noted that they insisted that she not spend too much time on art, at least initially. Um, it seems that for her, college was mostly a practice in fulfilling her parents' need for her to be this well-rounded, balanced person but that after college, she finally felt free to really pursue her art professionally. So I don't know about you, but I am a sucker for a good photo strip and this has to be one of my favorites. Uh, so this was taken sometime in the late 1920s, uh, which is around the time that Doris married Russell Werner Lee, who was an engineer who later worked as a photographer for the WPA. And I like to imagine Doris stepping into the photo booth here. She seems to be pretty dressed up. She's got her first stole, she has her lipstick on. Uh, she clearly understands her angles and she varies her position slightly. So after marrying, Doris and Russell went to Europe. Uh, they spent six weeks there in France and in Munich. I love this sort of upstairs, downstairs, double portrait of the two on that trip. Um, Doris remembers this as a pretty liberating time uh, she had long wanted to travel after graduating, and she saved up her birthday and odd job money to help finance this trip. Their marriage was doomed to end, however. Uh, Doris eventually fell in love with fellow artist Arnold Blanche, who we will meet shortly. While on their honeymoon, Doris created, uh, continued her creative work. She sketched and worked throughout the entire trip. She described her work at that time as a confused mess. Uh, but I think that that time represented her shift into focus, um, focusing on art more seriously. And in fact, she spent an additional two months in France alone painting. Following their time in Europe, Doris and Russell landed in Ottawa, Illinois, before moving to Kansas City, where Doris enrolled in the Kansas City Art Institute, where she studied under uh, Ernest Lawson, who was a member of the group of eight. Uh, so here on the left, we have Ernest Lawson's Spring Night Harlem River from 1913. And then of course we have Doris Lee, Illinois River Town from 1937. So I'm pairing these two images here, uh, not because this subject is particular to Lee or to Lawson, but rather I think that it demonstrates the continuum on which Lee exists. I think that there's a tendency to sometimes overly define practice, but in so many ways, art is just a variation on a theme. And going through the archive is this really wonderful exercise in recognizing patterns and themes. And as you guys will see, Doris's work is just full of them. So after living in Kansas City and studying with Lawson, Lee returned to Europe, uh, specifically Italy and then Paris. And in Paris, she studied with the Cubist painter, Andre Lot, whose influence would later be evident in her treatment of color and shape. So on the left, we have Lot. Lascal or the stopover from 1913. And then on the right, of course, we have Doris Lee's The Beach Party, uh, which was painted during Doris's first year at Woodstock, which we'll touch on a bit later. So looking at these two paintings, I think that the influence of Cubism is evident in The Beach Party. Uh, though her work doesn't bear the flat picture frame or the abstracted geometry signature to the Cubist style, 
but we do see sort of her arrangement of form and use of color as pseudo-cubist. Uh, and we know that Lee herself spoke about color and shape being one of the first things that she considered in her work uh, with narrative following after. And I think this approach to her work will also be evident further into our discussion. And one thing I like in comparing these two images uh, is the similarity and gesture of the figures. In both paintings, the figures are sculptural, they're intentional, they engage in movement and this sort of like marks a specific ritual or a time of day. Uh, for example, in Lescal, we have the woman pinning her hair back, and then we have the woman raising her left arm in the beach party. And again, we'll see the beach party shortly, so don't worry. So the 1930s were a very busy time for Lee. Uh, she studied at the San Francisco School of Art, Arnold Blanche, who we see in this image with Doris. Uh, the image itself is from 1954. In the early 1930s, Lee was painting primarily abstract works, which he described as on the half-baked side. But Blanche, who would later become her partner, uh, suggested that she try painting from nature or painting subjects that she liked. And this was a big shift that would guide her work for the coming years. Uh, that said, Lee never fully abandoned abstraction. As I'm sure many of you know, she returned to it later in her work. So here we have the infamous Thanksgiving from 1935, a little bit of a larger look at it. Uh, so again, this is the prize that she won the Logan Prize for. <clears throat> And in a very fortuitous 24 hours in 1936, she learned on the same day that she had won this competition and that she had also won the competition to do the murals at the federal post office here in DC. So I think it's safe to say that by 1936, she was well on her way to success. A few years before that, in 1931, Doris, who was still married to Russell, moved to the artist colony at Woodstock. And that move would be very fortuitous for Lee, uh, but it did sound the death knell for their marriage. So Woodstock was a home to a wide ranging group of intellectuals, musicians, and writers. And it would remain Doris's primary residence for the rest of her career. Its proximity to New York allowed her to maintain her studio at East 14th Street, uh, while giving her the opportunity to revel in the nature afforded to her outside of the city. So Doris and Russell were initially very good friends with Arnold and his wife, Lucille. Eventually, Doris and Arnold began a romance, a romantic relationship that ended both, part, both early marriages, but then led to their lifetime partnership. Um, so over their time together, Doris, Doris and Arnold shared two homes in Woodstock. And here we have an image of the living room of their second home, which is a pretty modern building that also housed her studio, which I'll be showing you later. And in looking at this image from their living room, we see what, the, what collectors they were, right? Uh, Doris is holding some kind of mobile or hanging sculpture, and we see furs and paintings and rugs. It's a room with a lot of texture. And you can compare this shot to her painting the wall, for example, from the mid 1950s, and you really start to get a sense of how true to life a lot of her work really was. So here is a shot of Arnold with the painter, photographer, and printer, Kunioshi. Uh, the artist colony at Woodstock was very collaborative and differences in style and practice were really widely accepted. And Doris's work at this time started to center on lots of different subjects, but her American scenes were really a touchstone during a time of pretty deep instability for the country. Uh, her community at Woodstock inspired much of her work, including this painting, which bears reason to sing. So here again, we have the beach party from 1932, and there are many appearances from people in Woodstock in this painting. Uh, Kuniyoshi appears here. Artist and activist Catherine Schmidt is in this painting. I believe she's the woman with her arm raised. And then also the artist Peggy Bacon is recognizable. I believe she's the woman in green on the left. That said, if anybody thinks any differently, hop into the chat, let me know. This is just my first read on the painting. Um, in 1939, Doris was commissioned by Life Magazine to document Showboat, the first racially integrated show on Broadway. Uh, this image is taken from two pages put together, which is why it looks a little bit weird, uh, but it's from the November 27th, 1939 issue of the magazine. Over the ensuing years, she would travel and she would record her impressions, like I said, of North Africa. She also went to Cuba and to Mexico. Uh, this is a spread called Lee's Adventures. This is also from Life Magazine. This is the May 12th, 1947 issue. And I think at least two of the images uh, in this 
feature are in the show. I think the giant cypress tree is in the show. It's one of my favorite Dorothy images. So in picking through the archive, you really get this sense of how Lee's work was really grounded in her life. It seems that the boundary between her creative practice and her lifestyle was essentially non-existent. It can be really illuminating uh, to pair the archival collection with pieces in the show. So starting with this photo, I love this photo for so many reasons. Uh, the angle is so clever. There's the use of the mirror. She has this really intense focus. We have this massive scale of her painting. Can anybody recognize which one it is? And then last but not least, her fabulous outfit. Um, and in discussing her methodology, we said that she painted in clear, simple stages, of course, unless she was experimenting, which she said often happens. So here is another shot from that same photo shoot. This is taken sometime between 1935 and 1937. And we can see that Lee is working on Illinois River Town, of course, uh, which shows a view across the Illinois River to Ottawa, Illinois, where she and Russell settled early in their marriage. And I really love getting to see the alchemy of the painting here, how the painter is also a scientist. And Lee was really generous with teaching her practice, uh, and she would actually later co-author a book with Blanche on it. So speaking of her generosity, here she is in 1944 at Michigan State College. Um, and in discussing her own experiences with learning, we remarked that, quote, fine stimulating teachers are perhaps one of the most important formative influences in our lives. And I feel like that's something I just love about Doris. Uh, she was pragmatic and practical, uh, but she also took her work seriously without taking herself too seriously. Uh, in this image of her studio's interior, this was taken sometime between 1945 and 1955, we can start to identify the figures and shapes and the animals and personalities that appeared in her work. Uh, there's the horse on the wall, there's the greenery out her window, we have the squirrel, the little stuffed squirrel on the ledge of the window there, the mirror behind her. These are all, all things that are so recognizably Doris Lee. And again, in looking through her archive, her creative work really comes alive and achieves this really delicious dimension. So now we're gonna transition a little bit and we're gonna see what the items in the archive might tell us about the way that she worked. So here to start is an image of Doris astride the horse. So as I mentioned, Doris grew up riding horses and her studios, sketches and paintings are just filled with them. And then we have her painting, The Widow from 1935. In the introductory essay of this show's catalog, curator Melissa Wolf noticed, noted, notes, pardon me, that this painting, The Widow, was perhaps inspired by Lee's own widowed grandmother. And in looking at both of these pictures, the painting and the photograph, you get a real sense of that like maternal feminine strength. The archive is also home to quite a few of her sketchbooks. Some of them are literally falling apart at the seams. These are items that were clearly used a lot and you can imagine her carrying them around with her and kind of tossing them into bags. Uh, there are sketches of figures, of animals, of street scenes and rural landscapes. Some of them are titled and in most of them you can see her working out ideas that she would later perfect on campus. So the sketchbooks are this really wonderful mixture of concentration and distraction. Things like shopping lists act as marginalia to her sketches. So here, for example, we have a list that says pajamas, pork roast, sparkle gelatin and raspberries. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm curious. Uh, w cream, which I'm assuming is for the sparkle gelatin. Uh, toilet paper, best potatoes, lettuce, oranges, and bank. So we just get this wonderful stream of consciousness from her. And Lee herself noted that she always worked by making small sketches and that that combined with random notes, she was really able to experiment and come up with the perfect arrangements that she wanted. Uh, this is a little sketch that I came across and just loved too much to not share. Uh, I'm not totally sure what it's for, to be honest. Uh, Tito's Hack is a real book. It was authored by one Melchor G. Farrar. Uh, but the published version is illustrated by Jean Charlot. So it's possible that Lee was in the running for this job, but didn't get it. But however the sketch came to be, I'm delighted that it exists. 
it just brings me so much joy. Here is a page that Doris used as a journal. And in it, we get a glimpse of how she's starting to understand the role of art and the artist. And she says, I've been thinking about thinking and that's very bad. Of course, ignorant people must think, but when you get through being ignorant then you can be free to imagine, wonder and invent. Thinking is a fine emetic or carrying the metaphor farther, a cathartic, getting rid of a lot of routine and trite concepts and their accompanying prejudices. It seems to me that the artist world is a world of intuition and freedom. The advanced guard of consciousness and the wary worried thinkers trudge cautiously behind. One can say, maybe the artist takes us down some blind alleys or builds big avenues that lead to nowhere. Well, maybe we aren't going very much of anywhere anyway. Besides, if we know what's there, why not go somewhere where we don't know? Take Hollywood, and then she just kind of trails off. In her sketchbooks, we have street scenes and vintage, uh, visions of people. They vary in detail, but the sense of curiosity and observation is really constant, such as things like this much more detailed street scene. So I think, like I said, that the sketchbooks really act as a portal into Lee's practice uh, and her practice of experiment and observation. And the apparent simplicity of many of her compositions belies their complex and intentional underlying structure. So take, for example, the Sinners from 1952. Like group seen in classical and Renaissance art, these figures are structured to demonstrate multiple viewpoints. We see them from front and back, we see them in profile, we see them in stillness and in action. And here we have two different rural scenes. <clears throat> I really love seeing these two landscapes right next to each other. There are two variations on the theme that demonstrate her deep level of focus and concentration. And you really get a sense that each time Doris looked at something, she was seeing something new or different. And on the left, of course, here we have the location indicated of this sketch. It says, looking south from road, leading to Kramer Farm High Woods. So in looking at these sketches, you can really see how something like this became this, which is, of course, the view Woodstock 1946. And every time I look at this painting, I just want to walk right into it. So after looking at her sketches and at her studio, this image is already pretty familiar, right? We see the horses in the lower right hand corner, for example, we recall the horse on the wall of her studio. And you realize in impairing one of her paintings with a piece in the archive, that not only was she creating an atmosphere in her imagery, but she was actually describing and celebrating her actual physical environment. I'm just gonna go back to the sketches really quick, because I think that seeing the sketches before seeing the painting really underscores how brilliant her use of color is. And that genius of color brings us to the next thing in the archive, uh, which is her pastel color studies. So these beautiful pieces are these diminutive pastels. They're smaller than a playing card. Uh, it's just trim sketch paper. And I mentioned earlier that Lee never abandoned abstraction. And in these gorgeous pieces, you really get that sense of how like her underlying compositions were working. They are delicate and they are very intentional. And they still bear the physical trace of Lee, as you can see here in the bottom in the center of this one, it's actually her fingerprint at the bottom of the paper. And she often uses this comic look like structure. And she's already clearly imagining, you know, the, the canvas and the frame that these experiments would be finalized on. So here's one that looks like it's two variations on an idea, but it's actually three. We can see looking at the top and the bottom that the shapes shift slightly between the, the two pictures and that she's then considering a third variation in the text below. Her work in these pastels is really patient and gentle. She's not in a hurry whatsoever. Uh, and the repetition of theme and approach is very meditative and considered. So here is one beautiful color study. And then here is Earth and Sky from 1967. So again, keep in mind how small the pastel is. It's smaller than a playing card. And in contrast to this painting, uh, which is 35 by 40 inches. 
And then here we have one paired with the gong from 1962. And we can really see that she's leaning harder into abstraction here with her layers of shapes uh, and balances and use of color. So in addition to the pastels, it can be really interesting to look at her preparatory sketches. And I love this set. Uh, so here we have, of course, five scenes. Some of them have the colors indicated already, which is a practice that she did quite a bit. Uh, it's a series of still lives here or beak scenes. So take a look for me at the shape of the trees in the box here at the top right. And then we're gonna take a look at her 1961 lithographic print along the waterway. And then we can take the same group of sketches here, but this time we're gonna look at the variation of shape and balance in the still lives of fruit. And then we have oranges and avocados from 1915. So the difference in time between oranges and avocados and along the waterway, which again, the print is from 1961, some 10 years difference. But when you pair it with this one set of preparatory sketches, I think we can demonstrate her desire to perfect composition. She keeps returning to the same ideas and she's working them over and over again until she's satisfied with what she gets. Here is another set of sketches. It's a series of patterns. Uh, there are swirls, there's some kind of like tic-tac-toe, we have an arrow, we have a compass, and it's a real exploration of repetition in space. And it's fun to see how these little sketches became other pieces, in this case, a textile. This is printed cotton. So she did a series called her Pioneer Pathways series, in which she designed textiles uh, for the Riverdale Fabric Company. And a pattern like this could be purchased for use in things like upholstery and curtains and bedding and slip covers. And Lee's work in commercial products really allowed people to have, you know, a practical domestic item that served double duty as a work of art. And again, I think just her lack of pretension allowed her to make art accessible on this really big scale, which is just wonderful. So moving away from her sketchbooks to other items in the archive, uh, there is a large amount of clippings and images that she used as reference materials. And these materials are organized into categories, uh, including farm life, horses, of course, uh, urban spaces, people, rural landscapes, barns, rural towns and homes, animals, and then also Florida scenery. So by looking at these two images, which she used, we can see how they might have helped her make this, of course, which is Fox and Geese from 1950, another one of my favorite pieces in the shelf. So as the catalog notes about this painting, Lee strikes a really wonderful balance here between realism and abstraction, and she uses shape to orient the eye within a narrative. And you can also get a sense of her color studies here, right? There's this careful balance of blues and greens and grays. And then there's this shock of red right in the center with the figure crossing the circle. And it's intentional and powerful without losing its sense of whimsy. So here we have her preparatory sketches for fox and geese. Uh, again, she's laying them out. It's like grid, it's almost like a comic book. And then again, there's this experimentation with balance in the composition. Uh, the circle of snow is always consistent with the exception of the sketch on the bottom left, the circle is always split into six equal triangles. And then around that central shape, uh, which almost functions like a clock, we experiment with the placement of figures and buildings. The catalog has another set of preparatory sketches for this painting, uh, which I would highly recommend looking at if you have the opportunity, uh, especially for any other fans of the painting. Another one of my favorite pieces in the show is Lee's rendition of an iconic Hollywood landmark, Schwab Pharmacy. So as I mentioned, Lee spent some time in Hollywood. Uh, first, she went on assignment for life in 1945. Uh, they had her do a feature on the film Harvey Girl which was starring Angela Lansbury and Judy Garland. Uh, and here we have Lee's rendition of Angela Lansbury's character, M, the barroom queen and saloon singer. Three years later in 1948, Lee returned to Hollywood to create paintings for The Pirate, which also starred Miss Garland, 
Uh, this is a shot from the opening credits of that film uh, in which Garland's character is reading this large book and she's turning the pages and she turns to this wonderful image by Doris Lee. And we definitely get the sense of Lee's Florida paintings here and the extensive time she spent in Key West. <clears throat> a few of her paintings in the show are rep reminiscent of this image. Excuse me. So going back to Schwab. Schwab's itself was a drugstore located on Sunset Boulevard. It was known for catering to movie actors and industry types from the 1930s to the 1950s. Uh, Lee certainly would have been familiar with the establishment as we can see here. So this is one of her preparatory sketches, of course. And just going back to the photograph, actual Schwab's, and then to her sketch, we can see that it's very true to life. And she'd already clearly thought through quite a bit what she wanted to do once she got to this point. Uh, so this sketch was done in 1945 when she was working in Hollywood. And as I mentioned earlier, she had a regular practice of just labeling what colors she wanted to use. So we can see her thinking through that sort of visual color balance from the very beginning. And again, her focus here on shape and layout. The buildings are super detailed, you'll notice, but the sidewalks are totally empty. And then, of course, we have Schwab, the painting uh, from 1945. And we can see that she has now added figures, uh, which, again, I think just speaks to her really focusing on color and shape before being worried about narrative and figure. And in some ways, I think it's similar to what we saw for the sketches for Fox and Geese. Uh, where the figures act as the pieces that unite this underlying base of geometry. <clears throat> in addition to her work in Hollywood, Lee entered the realm of book publishing. She did the illustrations for a 1944 children's book titled The Great Quillow. Uh, the archive is home to wonderful preparatory sketches for this project, a page of which we see here on the left. Uh, she obviously wasn't happy with the technique she used uh, per the note she's written on the bottom. The image on the right is the, vision, is the version that ultimately appeared in the book. She also wrote a small autobiography in 1946 titled Doris Lee. It's a very slim volume with plenty of black and white images of her work. And then in 1955, she and Blanche published It's Fun to Paint painting for enjoyment, uh, which is this really encouraging and playful and structural manual, manual on painting for amateurs and teachers alike. It's sort of like ways of seeing, uh, but much more practical. So to close, we have this wonderful photograph of Doris. I feel like killer playful gaze, this wonderful pattern dress, of a lion, and then of course her ubiquitous cigarette. And in describing herself, Lee said, I enjoy people, the orchard and garden, watching birds, collecting shells, stones and butterflies, and many other things, traveling, sometimes fishing, the theater and movies, and lots of reading and eating. I like many different kinds and periods of painting and sculpture, and in a very modest way, I collect that too. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me this evening and for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with Doris. And I think we can open the floor for questions. Emily, I want to thank you so much. This has just been delightful. I know for everyone, um, but especially for those who have been able to see the exhibition and, and spend some time with many of the works that you've referenced or covered here, especially with those preparatory drawings. So thank you for that. And you know what? I on my screen actually Emily has frozen. Maybe so we'll go. I'm, oh yeah. Okay. You're I think I'm you're gonna, back. I'm gonna turn my camera off. I'm okay. here, but I'm gonna turn my camera off just because my connection is a bit unstable, but I'm still here, not to worry. No, that, that sounds great. Thank you. And I'm gonna put this side by side then. Um all right, so let's see, we do have something. There was a question earlier in the Q&A, but you ended up answering it. So thank you for that. Um, Good. <laughs> all right, so uh, we have a comment here and a question. Thank you, very enjoyable. I'm from Illinois and was made aware of tonight's presentation as Doris was the wife of Arnold Blanche. My interest is in murals and post offices. Her husband was commissioned for the Columbus, Wisconsin mural. Other than the DC post office, do you know if she painted any other post office murals? And then there's a secondary question that I'll follow up with after that. 
Okay. It's a great question. And I don't know off the top of my head, my main knowledge around her work for the WPA was the murals in the DC post office. Um, I would be very curious to know if anybody has seen those murals. I myself have tried to get into that building multiple times, but since it's now home to the EPA, they have pretty great security. Um, so I actually haven't gotten to see them myself, but yeah, my understanding is that that was her primary work for the WPA. Okay, thank you. And then the second question, does the museum have, and I know that you're not officially with the museum right now, but do you know if the museum has further biographies on the women artists of the, um, women artists of the WPA? Absolutely they do. Um, and I would encourage anybody who's interested to go onto NIMWA's website and uh, the folks at the LRC or the library are very responsive and there are, um, online artist profiles, like I mentioned, we also have a really extensive collection of um, artist files. So that's a really great resource. And then we have the archival collections of a number of other women who are working at this time. And so absolutely, yeah, there are those resources for sure. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and drop um, the Let's see here, the link to Nimwa's page on Doris Lee into the chat. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. Um, let's see here. So uh, we have Lee did a mural for Somerville, Georgia. And uh, also, this is from uh, a guest named Emily. You can now request a tour of the EPA building through the GSA. That's fantastic. So, thank you, Emily. I will be for doing sharing, that. Yes. Sharing that information with everyone. Um, and then we have another uh, a comment here um, from Marie, who was able to see the exhibit yesterday and can't wait to revisit it with all of this background. Marie, I'm so glad you're able to see the exhibition. She says, thank you, Emily. And I know many others are expressing their gratitude um, to you for this excellent presentation as well. It's just it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, we'll give it another second in case anybody else has a comment or a question that they'd like to, sh to share. Okay. Um, let's see here. So from another guest, are there any other books written about Doris? And then can't wait to come visit. We look forward to hosting you here. Other books, Emily, I wonder if there's a good resource page or even link I could send. You know, it's so funny. So I work at the Library of Congress now and they would have almost everything just in terms of because stuff gets, you know, sent there for copyright. And so I was able to just get three books, which were the ones that I mentioned. So there's The Great Quillow, painting for enjoyment. And then again, just her little autobiography. I have the catalog in front of me. The catalog is frankly the best resource that I have found on Doris Lee, hands down. I think that there's a big gap in the scholarship about her. Um, so I would imagine that she's mentioned in other things, but I have not had much luck in finding specific, like a Doris Lee monograph, for example. I have one more question that came in, Emily. Would you mind just quickly um, Not at entertaining all. No, it? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. So the catalog mentioned Doris received letters from inmates who appreciated her painting. Any idea which ones? About which painting? I did not see those letters myself in the archive. I know that they're there, um, but that would be a great question to ask the LRC themselves. So I would, I think. Go ahead and take a look. And I would also, one thing I want to try to toss, and I don't know, I don't have the link right off my head, but I would say the first step I would do is take a look at the finding aid for the collection, which is essentially like an index of the collection. And you can find that on the LRC's website. And then go through that, go to the correspondence section, and then you can email and ask uh, to have somebody to make some scans of you. And you could actually get those letters just in your hand. Take oh, that's so cool. All right. And I do know yeah. our friend who posted this, so I'll make sure that he gets that, um, that website, mm -hmm. which we have. I want to thank you, Emily, again, for putting together this wonderful presentation, sharing your passion for the subject matter, but also your expertise in this. I know it was a very fun research time for you. And we wish you all the best as you kind of move forward um, with your career in that. We look forward to staying in touch. I also want to thank mm -hmm. Nimwa for putting us in contact with you and for, you know, housing the archive in the first place. It's noble work and we're very grateful for it. Last, I wanna thank all of our participants this evening. It's been a pleasure hosting you. We look forward to seeing you um, at future programs, either in the museum, like for next week's film or maybe online. So everyone, I hope you have a wonderful evening 
Thank you again. Take care and good night.